just a little bit of background. As you noticed, I'm not a doctor. I'm a journalist. Um, I was kind of an investigative science journalist. I began in the early 80s. Um, wrote books about people who discovered non-existent phenomena. Uh, in the early 90s, some of my, I got fascinated with this question of good science and bad science, how hard it is to learn the truth about anything. And in the early 90s, some of my friends in the physics community suggested that if I was fascinated with bad science, I should look at some of the research in public health. So I moved into public health, and I kind of meandered through the field. And in the late 90s, I started looking at some of the crucial sort of uh, recommendations about what constitutes a healthy diet, starting with does salt cause high blood pressure. While I was doing that story, one of the five worst scientists I had ever interviewed, and I'd interviewed some horrible scientists in my life, took credit for getting Americans not just to eat less salt, but less fat and less eggs. And I literally put the phone down, and I called up my editor at the journal Science, and I said, when I'm done doing the salt story, I'm going to write a story about uh, fat and heart disease. I don't know what the story is, but I know if this fellow was involved in any substantive way, there's a good story there. <laughs> <clears throat> so literally, I was completely unbiased when I began this. All I knew was that there was a bad scientist out there who was taking credit for a low-fat diet. So I wrote uh, the science story. I wrote a famous New York Times Magazine story or an infamous story called uh, What If Fat Doesn't Make You Fat or What If It's All Been a Big Fat Lie. That got me a nice book advance, so I got to do this book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. I spent five years on it. The advance lasted four. Um, <laughs> this book is, I actually had one, somebody introduced me at an sem obesity seminar once at USC where he said, he wrote this big book. Um, it's big. So I then wrote the, next slide, I wrote the uh, airplane reading version last year called Why We Get Fat. Um, and the lecture is based, the book is based on this lecture that you're about to hear. And actually, this book is, it's amazing. You write a book that's short and people can read on a cross-country airplane flight and suddenly people start paying attention to you. And now I'm getting in, invitations to lecture on about twice a week from people who read this book. You know, they say, I was flying to Phoenix and I read your book or I was flying on vacation. Anyway, so moving into the, uh, that's the background. Next slide. Okay, this is the context which Sean hinted at. There's an obesity epidemic going on. I won't go into the details, but you can see that obesity levels in the U.S. have increased about 250 percent since 1960. Next slide. Goes along with the diabetes epidemic. Uh, diabetes diagnoses in the United States have increased threefold since 1980. Um, next slide. And here's the. Uh, this is sort of the underlying, this is how the nutrition establishment or the, the conventional wisdom sees this, which is obesity is related with a higher risk of all these disorders, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cancer, asthma, sleep apnea, neurodegeneration, actually Alzheimer's disease. And the way the conventional wisdom has is as we get fatter, that then increases our risk. Being fat increases our risk of all these diseases through a variety of mechanisms. And I'm not going to get into this today, but the subtext of what I'm saying in my books is whatever makes us fat also causes these diseases. So if you get breast cancer, for instance, it's likely to be caused by the same thing that makes you fat. If you have a heart attack or you're hypertensive or you have a stroke, it's likely to be caused. It's not, you don't have it because you're fat. You have it because the same thing that makes you fat causes those diseases. And then, of course, what we want to know is what makes us fat. So why do we get fat? Okay, simple question. Here's the obvious answer. Obesity occurs when a person consumes more calories from food than he or she burns. That's how the NIH puts it. The U.S. Surgeon General tells us that the overweight is a result of caloric imbalance. Too few calories expended for the amount of calories consumed. And my question is, how many of you in the room believe this to be true? Because if you don't, I can go. <laughs> okay, how many of you have read my books? Okay, well, then we'll just go through it anyway. Okay, next slide. Um, so here's the conventional wisdom. Energy in is greater than energy out. Next slide. Boom, we overeat. Okay, there's a lot of ways. When you read the research literature, you often hear this phrase, uh, you know, they'll say obesity is an energy balance disorder. And that means you get fat because you take in more calories than you expend. If you read the animal literature on obesity, they'll talk about hyperphagia being the cause. Hyperphagia means you eat too much. These animals have a ratio of appetites. Next slide. So one of the things we want to do in science, here's basically what we're talking about. You know, we don't expend enough energy and we, um, 
we consume too much. And then one of the things we want to do in science, we want to explain the observation. So not only do we want to explain obesity, we want to explain the obesity epidemic. Next slide. So the way we do that is we blame it on increased prosperity. Okay, this is a phrase that Marion Nessel, an NYU nutritionist, used in Science Magazine in 2002. And the idea is in the past 40, 50 years, since 1960, we've got richer as a nation, more fast food joints, more food available. The food tastes too good, it's too hard to say no. And as we get richer, we have less and less reason to be physically active. I actually had an obesity researcher tell me that if everyone went back to rolling down their own car windows, they'd lose, we'd lose a pound a year. So all these little energy saving devices. Another way to phrase it, next slide, is that we live in a toxic environment, okay? This is Kelly Brownell's phrase. Kelly is a psychologist at Yale. And it's interesting, we're gonna get to this point about psychologists being the experts on obesity. Toxic environment is an is a, is a environment that promotes eating too much and promotes sedentary behavior. And the way Kelly put it is, you know, cheeseburgers and uh, uh, cheese curls and french fries and McDonald's and Burger King are so much a part of our environment as trees and clouds. You basically can't drive down the street or walk through a store without having food scream out to you, eat me. And meanwhile, we keep our children home from school. They don't play, you know, we don't want to let them play. We don't let them ride bicycles to school anymore because it's too dangerous. We have all these computers, video games, and television. So basically, a toxic environment is one where there's all this food available and we can't say no to it and we don't have enough reason to uh, you know, burn it off. Again, another line I got from obesity research is we don't have to kill a woolly mammoth for a dinner anymore. So food comes at too little expense of energy. So next slide. Here's our hypothesis. Increased prosperity causes overeating, which is energy in greater than energy out, and the result is obesity and the obesity epidemic. And what we want to know basically is, next slide, is this true? Okay, so science and science, it's a hypothesis, it seems obvious, but is it true? So next slide. One of the things I did in the course of my research, which the medical research establishment should have done and the obesity research community should have done, and it's kind of embarrassing that they didn't do it, is I simply went through and I looked for observations that might refute this hypothesis, counterexamples, as the scientists would call them. So let's start with the first one, which is what I call the Fat Louisa Paradox. This photo was taken in 1902 by a Harvard anthropologist. The woman in the photo, he told her, Fat Louisa, she's a Pima Indian. The Pima live on a, now they live on a reservation south of Phoenix, Arizona. Next slide, please. And one of the little known things about the Pima is that they used to be the most affluent Native American tribe. They were hunters and gatherers and farmers. They hunted in the nearby mountains. They ate fish and clams from the Gila River, which ran through their territory. They raised the wheat and corn. They had pigs and cattle. And in 1846, when a U.S. Army battalion went through the Pima Territory on what would become the Santa Fe Trail, the battalion surgeon pointed out that the Pima were, quote, sprightly and in fine health, and they had warehouses full of food. Okay, so much so that this drawing was actually made in 1852-53. 1849, gold's discovered in California, and over the next 30 years, some 20 to 60,000 49ers go west through the, Cali through the Pima territory, and the U.S. government asked the Pima to feed them. That's how much food they have, and they do. And what happens then is that beginning in the 1870s, Anglo-Americans and Mexican-Americans start moving into the Pima territory, and they um, overhunt the nearby mountains, so the game disappears, and they divert the Gila River water to irrigate their own fields. And by 18, uh, 1902, excuse me, the 1870s, the Pima are going through what they call the years of famine that last 20 to 30 years. And by 1902, next slide, the Pima are now living on a reservation. Their land has been turned into a reservation. They're living on government rations to survive. They're still eking out a living as farmers. And um, Frank Russell, this Harvard anthropologist, comes to look at them and says there's a degree of obesity on the tribe completely at odds with the image, the popular Indi image of the tall and sinewy Indian, you know, that's been popularized. And he takes this picture of uh, Fat Louisa. And he, you know, the point of this is, Here's a tribe that over the course of 50 years went from prosperity to poverty, okay? And from lean and sprightly and in fine health to having this surprising level of obesity. And this is the opposite of what our hypothesis predicts. Our hypothesis said if you go from poverty to prosperity, you get fat. 
And here we have the opposite happening. So let's go to the next slide. You know, what we wanted, if that was the only example of this, it would be you could write it off as the exception to the rule. Next slide. But there happens to be a lot of them. Okay, I, I collected about a dozen prior to 1980. A lot of these studies were done by diabetes researchers, actually. We're looking at high levels of diabetes in the same population. But it begins with the Sioux on the South Dakota Crow Creek Reservation in 1928. This was a study done by two University of Chicago economists. In the living conditions, these people were poor beyond our imagination. Like you could, um, you know, the term dirt poor was invented to describe populations like this. They lived in four to eight people per room. They didn't have indoor toilets. They had to go down to the river to get water. Um, Fifteen families on this population with 32 children among them were living chiefly on bread and coffee. There were plenty of signs among the population that there was malnutrition going on. Some of the children were stunted and yet um, the obesity rates aren't that different than what we have in the United States today. 40% of the women, a quarter of the men, and 10% of the children were distinctly fat. And 20% of the women, a quarter of the men and children were extremely thin. And this is a combination of obesity coexisting with malnutrition that I'm going to come back to because it's an absolutely um, uh, extremely significant observation. Next slide. African Americans, Charleston, South Carolina in 1959, 30% of the women are obese, 18% of the men in the family incomes are 9 to $53 a week, okay? That's the equivalent of about $360 a week in today's money. Next slide. Zulus in Durban, South Africa, 40% of the women are obese. Women in their 40s average 175 pounds. Women in America today average about 165 pounds. Next slide. Trinidad in the early 1960s had a malnutrition crisis. The U.S. government sends a team of nutritionists down to Trinidad to deal with it, and they come back and they report that a third of the women over 25 are obese, and that obesity is, quote, a potentially serious medical problem in women. And the next year, an MIT nutritionist goes down to study the diets of the lean and obese individuals in the population, and they report that the per capita daily diet is less than 2,000 calories, 21% fat, very low fat, and that was fewer calories than recommended by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN at the time for a healthy diet. Next slide. Bantu pensioners, South Africa pensioners, these are the poorest, most disenfranchised of a disenfranchised South African population. 30% of the women are severely overweight. The mean weight over 60 is 165 pounds. Next slide. Rarotonga in the South Pacific, over a quarter of the women are grossly obese. Next slide. Factory workers in Chile. 1974. 30% are obese, nearly 50% of the women over 54, 10% suffer undernourishment. So there's that combination again of obesity and undernourishment. And most are engaged in heavy labor. So they're not training for marathons, they're not working out at a health club like this every day, they're not going for power walks 45 minutes a day, but they're working on a construction line in a factory in Chile in the 1970s, and yet they have this level of obesity is higher or higher than we have in the United States today. And the question is why? Obviously, heavy labor does not protect you from, you know, these people are more physically active than we are, and yet they have a high level of obesity. Next slide. This is the last one. Mexican-American, Star County, Texas. That's um, on the border of Mexico, about 200 miles due south of San Antonio. 50% of the women in their 50s are obese, 40% of the men in the 40s. The living conditions, most inhabitants are employed in agricultural labor and or work in the oil fields in the country, okay? So again, these are hard-working, poor people. And there was one restaurant in Starr County, Texas in 1981, a Mexican restaurant. So there's no McDonald's, no Burger Kings, no computer games, no video games. I doubt they had televisions, although they might have. And yet they had these high levels of obesity. And the point is, next slide, why were these populations fat? Okay, because if we know why these populations were fat, we probably know why our population is fat. And the idea is not that there wasn't something toxic about the environment, because there obviously was. But the question is, what was it? Because if it was simply, you know, lack of reason to exercise, sedentary behavior, and too much food, that they didn't have. Next slide. So here's how this question was phrased in 1973, before this idea that it was all about calories set in, so, you know, like ice on a pond. Excuse me, Ralph Richards. He's a diabetes specialist, trained in the United Kingdom. In the early 1960s, he traveled to Jamaica, 
started a diabetes clinic at the University of the West Indies. And in 1973, he reported that two-thirds of the adult women were obese in Jamaica and 10% of the men. And he said, it's difficult to explain the high frequency of obesity seen in a relatively impecunious society such as exists in the West Indies when compared to the standard of living enjoyed in the more developed countries. He's stating the same paradox I'm giving you. We should think that the rich countries should be fat, right? Not the poor ones. So malnutrition and subnutrition are common disorders in the first two years of life in these areas and account for almost 25% of all admissions to pediatric wards. Subnutrition continues in early childhood to the early teens, so it's not just that the kids aren't getting enough vitamins and minerals, enough protein, they're not getting enough food, okay? They're stunted. Obesity begins to manifest itself in the female population from the 25th year of life and reaches enormous proportions from 30 onwards. Um, next. Now here's how that same question was phrased in 2005, after 30 years of believing in calories in, calories out being crucial, okay? This is from Benjamin Caballero, who runs a laboratory for human nutrition at Johns Hopkins University. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a pretty good journal. And Caballero says, a few years ago I was visiting a primary care clinic in the slums of Sao Paulo. The waiting room was full of mothers with thin, stunted young children exhibiting the typical signs of chronic undernutrition. Their appearance, sadly, would surprise few who visit poor urban areas in the developing world. What might come as a surprise is that many of the mothers holding those undernourished infants were themselves overweight. The coexistence of underweight and overweight poses a challenge to public health programs since the aims of programs to reduce undernutrition, which are, you know, make more food available, are obviously in conflict with those for obesity prevention, which is make less food available, okay? So I put this pose as a challenge to public health programs because the existence of underweight and overweight in the same population, the existence of, of overweight, obese mothers with starving children doesn't pose a challenge to your public health program. It poses a challenge to your paradigm, your belief system. If you believe that mothers got fat because they took in superfluous calories that they didn't need, that they weren't going to burn off, you also believe that they got fat taking in superfluous calories that they could have given to their children to keep them alive, okay? Now, how many of you are mothers here? How many of you would allow your children to starve to death so you could get fat? Okay, simple way of putting it. This observation goes against everything we believe about maternal behavior. So we have a paradigm that says people get fat because they eat too much, they overeat, energy balance, and we have a maternal behavior paradigm that says mothers will starve to themselves to death to give their kids food. And in fact, we wouldn't be here today if mothers were any different way because otherwise the children would have starved and the race wouldn't have gone on. Um, you got to throw out one paradigm or the other. You got to throw out either our energy balance paradigm or our maternal behavior paradigm. I'm going to throw out the, maternal, the, uh, excuse me, the energy balance paradigm because my mother would kill me if I didn't. 